Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's Keeping an Eye on the Geopolitical Ball with me, Jamie Shea, Senior Fellow at Friends of Europe. Uh, my topic this week is indeed a question. Can Ukraine join the European Union? Um, a few years ago, this would have seemed an absurd question. There were three good reasons why uh, Ukraine's EU membership uh, seemed unlikely, if not impossible. Uh, number one, uh, the country didn't have uh, a candidate status or a membership perspective. Uh, this perspective was given back in 2002 to the countries of the Western Balkans by the EU, but not to the so-called Eastern neighborhood countries like Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia. Uh, secondly, uh, Ukraine seemed very far away from meeting the EU standards, although after 1991, independence. It elected many democratic leaders. You think of uh, Yushchenko or Julia Timoshenko or Pyotr Poroshenko uh, before President Zelensky. They seemed incapable of translating noble uh, uh, European aspirations into effective reform and fighting uh, corruption. And thirdly, when Russia uh, annexed the Crimea back in 2014 and in invading the Donbass, the trigger for that crisis was not Ukraine wanting to join NATO, uh, but Ukraine uh, being on the cusp of uh, signing a deep and comprehensive free trade agreement with the EU. In, in other words, uh, Moscow's uh, opposition uh, to the EU uh, membership of Ukraine seemed as implacable <laughs> as its opposition uh, to NATO membership. But of course, uh, since uh, February the 24th, uh, all has changed. Uh, number one, Ukraine has had to turn away from the prospect of NATO membership, uh, and President Zelensky uh, uh, has at least for the time being accepted that. Hence, Ukraine has been refocusing on the other side of Brussels, the EU, uh, and has now sent a formal application uh, for uh, EU uh, membership. Secondly, uh, as you can imagine, there's been this outpouring of uh, emotion and support uh, in favour of uh, Ukraine, which is seen not simply as defending its territory, but very much as defending European EU values. Uh, I'm reminded a little bit of that famous headline in Le Monde uh, after the 9-11 terrorist attacks against the United States, which said we are all Americans now. And since February the 24th, we all feel uh, profoundly uh, European. President Zelensky has made an emotional appeal to the European Parliament, uh, and the Parliament has responded uh, just this week also by voting uh, strong resolutions in favour uh, of opening the EU's doors uh, to Kiev. But predictably, uh, EU leaders uh, are in something of a dilemma, as they so often are on so many issues. Uh, on the one hand, yes, uh, they fully uh, concede that this is not a time for business as usual. This is a historic uh, opportunity. Uh, and this is the moment to open that European perspective to the East, uh, as well as to the uh, Western Balkans. But on the other hand, being also uh, sober-minded, realistic politicians, they can see that, number one, uh, Ukraine is still very far away from meeting the standards, and there's no guarantee that once the war is over, uh, this great feeling of Ukrainian national solidarity, of pulling together under the inspiring leadership of Zelensky, won't give way to the usual petty politics, uh, corruption, and absence of reform. In, in any case, the irony is that the country, uh, although moving morally closer to uh, Europe uh, as a result of Russia's invasion, uh, in terms of the hit to its GDP and the destruction of its infrastructure, uh, the number of uh, people who have left the country, 5.5 million, uh, is moving further away from its ability to meet uh, European standards. And, and those European leaders also realise that, you know, after a decade uh, where the EU has had finally some success in deep Deepening um, in terms of more cooperation on defence, foreign policy, on health, uh, uh, fighting to defend the euro, setting up a, a recovery fund from COVID-19. They don't want to put this deepening process at risk now by a large and premature wave of further enlargement. So this week, uh, we wait with bated breath to see what the European Commission is going to uh, announce in terms of its AVI or an opinion on, on Ukraine. Uh, application and what the EU leaders uh, will decide to do about it when they meet in Brussels this week. I mean, they, they do have various uh, options. They, for example, can give candidate status to Kiev uh, with conditions. You need to do certain things before we can start negotiating. Uh, they can give candidate status 
uh, with a, a date, for example, at some time in the future to open uh, negotiations, or, although obviously not while the war is going uh, on. They could give candidate status, but with a kind of suspension clause that if Ukraine does not complete certain chapters, the 35 chapters uh, for the adhesion to uh, the EU treaties by a certain date, then they could put Ukraine's uh, 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 membership application on hold or, or, or even cancel it uh, altogether. I mean, Turkey has been in somewhat of this uh, situation for some years now uh, already. Um, but whatever the decision, to my mind, certain things are absolutely critical. Number one, don't humiliate Ukraine. I mean, President Macron talks about not humiliating Russia, but it's more important not to humiliate Ukraine. And it's our of, the, uh, of need turning towards Brussels and the European uh, family. So some kind of strong positive signal at a minimum has to be sent. Secondly, put all of the aspirant countries, whether from the Eastern neighborhood like Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, Georgia and Moldova have also now sent letters of application to Brussels, together with the countries of the Western Balkans, particularly countries like Serbia uh, and Montenegro that have already started the process of negotiation, uh, put them together so that they can share know-how and experience and move together as a group, helping each other uh, to meet the uh, standards for EU uh, membership. Uh, thirdly, uh, offer a, a plan, a concrete plan to Ukraine in terms of which which chapters can be negotiated when, uh, beginning with the easy ones like culture. This at least will focus the bureaucracy in Kiev uh, on preparations uh, for this process. Uh, the next thing, perhaps the most important thing of all, is to open up certain aspects of the EU to Ukraine and the other candidate countries um, as a kind of you know, appetizer of future EU membership, which could motivate them and show them some of the benefits of being EU members. Uh, for example, opening up uh, EU markets to more Ukrainian exports and agricultural uh, uh, products, Ukrainian energy, uh, linking up uh, grids, e electricity grids, and, and all of this. A lot of work has been done uh, in this domain already, uh, uh, bringing Ukraine in more into the common foreign and security policy, allowing Ukrainian troops to participate in the new EU rapid reaction force, uh, coming under 42.7 uh, of the Lisbon Treaty when it comes to the common solidarity clause to deal with cyber attacks or to uh, deal with uh, uh, disasters, extreme weather events, particularly caused by uh, uh, climate uh, change, uh, bringing in Ukraine more in uh, regular EU summits and political consultations. Uh, for the Ukrainians, this is something which would be much preferable uh, than uh, signing up to President Macron's idea of a European political community, uh, which they see as a second class sort of alternative to the real thing, e EU membership. So open up the EU rather than try to create some kind of alternative uh, uh, arrangement as well. Um, the key thing, however, it is not to get embroiled in legalistic arguments about what exactly candidate status means. Uh, the real imperative is to help Ukraine now uh, with weapons, uh, with finance, with uh, reconstruction uh, for the uh, uh, future. Uh, doing things now uh, is much more likely to make a possible Ukrainian EU membership realistic for the future. So in short, this is not the time for business as usual. We stand at historical juncture, uh, but the EU is quite right in needing to balance uh, the need now for more widening or enlargement with the need to preserve the results of the deepening process that have successfully been undertaken over the last uh, uh, decade. How the EU manages this balance is really going to be the key test now for its entire uh, future. But at least the good news is it brings us back to the reason why the EU was founded in the first place in the 1950s, which was to save the European continent from the scourge of war. We lost sight of that a little bit during the golden years years after the end of the Cold War, but that original purpose is now the one real reason why we still need the European Union. Thank you.